Hey guys, I'm so excited to have you here for episode two of the 2022 garden season year. I have decided to start calling these videos episodes rather than by the week because while I really hope to be able to make them weekly, this time I didn't. Um, it's actually been two weeks since the last video that I did of a garden tour. So I'm going to start giving you guys the date. Uh, that way, whenever you're watching these, maybe in the winter, maybe next year, you'll kind of have a good idea of how much time has lapsed between the episodes. And also so you can know kind of what's going on during the time of the year. Some of, the, some of you guys are watching these from like the other side of the world and uh, you know very different regions but I do think dates are important as gardeners kind of know where things are and for me because this is my garden journal right now you are watching what I will reference years from now whenever I'm trying to remember something so I've got to give this information for myself as well so today is June 26th it's my cousin Amy's birthday so happy birthday cousin Amy and it has been two weeks since the first garden tour in this season now if you're new here welcome my name is Jessica Sowards we are gardening in the Midlands of South Carolina and growing lots of food in other ways as well we have a homestead here uh, we've been at this property for almost a year now and we have been building pretty steadily since we got here. We moved from central Arkansas, which was a very, very similar growing uh, climate, very similar frost dates. I will say it's probably a little more humid here in the summer and it's a little colder there in the winter. So that is a little bit of difference, but for most intents and purposes of growing things, it is very similar. We are in zone eight here, which means that in the winter, um, our coldest general temperature on average is between um, 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like negative 12 to negative 6 Celsius. I do have a long growing season, do have a pretty mild winter, which means we're in the perfect place to grow lots of food, and that's what we're trying to do. If you're not new here, welcome back. I'm always glad to have you with me. All right, so let's go out and take a look at this garden. I'm actually out here a little bit later than usual, so I brought my own coffee. Usually Maya brings it to me. Well, we can start right here in the window greenhouse. Um, I've got a couple of things in here. I've got some sweet potatoes in this bucket. That's for a video that's coming up for a project. I'm going to show you guys how to do. Here, um, I've got some different plants that are waiting for the raised beds to be built. Obviously, they're ready. So that's on the list to do this week, I think. So I'll come right out the front door of the greenhouse into my little cottage garden in front of the greenhouse as you can see here it's filling in nicely i'm really liking this area and how it looks so over here is where we're going to be working this week to start laying out um, our raised bed potage garden and i think we're going to try to get this side at least started soon so i can put all of those started vegetable plants in but I'm not in a big rush to get this project done ASAP. So any garden that you're going to build, um, unless it's very small, and even small gardens, it's okay for it to take a couple of seasons. It's okay to have the vision for a thing and just steadily build and chip away at that. My garden in Arkansas took three or four seasons to build, three or four years. Um, we started that in, 2017 is when really we started it in 2016 is when we really started like planning it and laying it out started building it in 2017 um and we're still working on it in 2021 when we left we were still adding things to it as recently as the beginning of that year so that was a, a long process so we were a year in here and i mean honestly i have so many ideas and things that eventually we may get to. So here where the raised beds are going to be, one of the things I'm thinking about right now is I think I'm actually going to put a couple of smallish fruit trees along the sides uh, because we are full sun right here in the middle of this pasture where we've built this garden. And contrary to popular belief, some shade in your garden is actually a good thing. People seem to think that you have to have full sun, which means sun from the very early morning to the evening. And full sun, whenever that gardening term is used, it actually just means six hours of sun a day, like six hours of solid sunlight. And if you are gonna have somewhat dappled sunlight, you might need more than six hours uh, to really get that full six hours of exposure. Uh, but 14 hours a day in the South Carolina heat 
is actually very detrimental. So we're using things like shade cloth. You'll see this actually has shade cloth on it. I don't know if you can tell that. That has 50% shade cloth on it. Uh, my high tunnels down there have 50% shade cloth on it. And eventually, once we really see this plan through, we might even put some shade cloth sails up over other parts of the garden to offer them some protection from the sun. So along the side here, um, these are some daisies that are in here and lavender. Um, this actually needs some water. I'm going to, when I get done shooting this video, I'll move that over. This is some ornamental oregano. There's a couple of tomato plants in there. These are things that I'm planning on planting along this path right here. I just planted this bed last weekend. So this stuff is just getting it kind of over the transplanting. I've got a couple of rose bushes here in the corner. This one is called a uh, state of grace. I left the tags on until I could get them in some videos so I would have a record of them and remember them. Um, this one is called Ebb Tide. I think that one is like a really pretty purple. And back on the back side of the greenhouse, these are hookahs, uh, black pearl coral bell hookahs. And then these are a, a Linton rose called dark and handsome so both of these things actually appreciate a little shade and the morning right here is the only time that they're in sun like this once the sun comes up and over some the greenhouse shades these for the rest of the day so this is the shadiest place that i had to offer these plants i think they'll do okay here that tiny little thing is the puniest little mojito colocasia um, and I'm hoping that it makes it through and ends up getting kind of large here. So I did plant mostly low growing stuff. I haven't planted this side, but I did do mostly low growing ish stuff. I, I have some larger things on the corners of the greenhouse and I thought about, I haven't put it here yet, but I thought about putting like a climbing rose on the corner of the greenhouse on the north side uh, because this gets such a southern exposure on the rest. If I put it on the north side, I think it'll be okay to have that little bit of shade. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think a climbing rose that goes up this north side would be beneficial? Uh, do you think that it would be lovely? I think if I just add a little bit of trellising, it might be really cool. Fairy tale, I don't know. Haven't planted here. I'm totally open to suggestions on what y'all think should be there. This is a shrub rose. This one's called a uh, bubble double. Oh, it's like a really pretty uh, double petaled cup rose. And a lot of the things that I planted here in this perennial part of the garden are starting to fill out some. I really wasn't anticipating on this to, to look like a lot this year. Um, just because perennials often take some time to really get established and take off. And I'm really pleased with how it looks so far. And I can really imagine how it's going to be next year. There are going to be some benches here on these little wings that come out. And I haven't planted the rest of this space yet because I wanted to start on the raised bed garden and really get a better idea of how the space was going to flow. Obviously, this is still a work in progress. Um, like I said, it's going to be that way for a little while. Some of these things are struggling a little bit with the heat, so we'll see. These are black hollyhocks here, and a lot of their foliage died back, but then they started to grow new foliage, so hopefully they'll hang on with us and we'll be able to see our lovely black hollyhocks. One thing that we're not there yet, but as soon as we get like a lot of this building done, we're going to put the fence up, and that's going to make a really big difference in how all of this looks. Here we have the asparagus still steadily getting established. These are purple passion asparagus. And uh, you can see there's one coming up right there. I think they, they look really good. It'll be a couple years before we do much harvesting out of that. Here we have our sea of potatoes. This was multiple varieties. I think we had nine rows and they were sown at different times because uh, I like succession sowing things. It makes it a lot easier at harvest time and it also gives me an opportunity to can, preserve, whatever I'm going to do with them um, without having to do just such an overwhelming amount at once. So I've been canning potatoes this week and I've gotten a lot done and now I'm noticing that you know another variety is starting to show that it's getting close to being ready to be harvested. I'm seeing some browning, some creakling. The tops are going to start dying back. And that lets me know 
that it's time to harvest. And one thing I'm considering right now, though eventually we are going to go on both sides of the greenhouse with the raised bed potage. It's gonna mirror on both sides. I am considering maybe going ahead, and I have some potatoes that have sprouted, going ahead and planting another round out here. So potatoes, from putting a sprouted seed potato in the ground, in the soil, you're looking at about probably 75-ish days to harvest. Uh, they're gonna put on little flowers at some point and you can start harvesting them a couple weeks after that. And then when they really start dying back is when you know they're probably not gonna grow a lot more size. Um, and I was thinking if we get that side of the potage garden built, that's plenty of space for me to plant the warm weather things that I have. Maybe get some more tomatoes and peppers out of this year since we lost so much in our high tunnel uh, from contaminated soil. Oil. and I would like to have this other side done maybe for fall planting but even then I might not need it I'm not sure so potatoes are just such a great way to put food in the pantry and I thought well I've got all those sprouted ones maybe we'll do another round here harvest those around maybe the end of September beginning of October and then we could go ahead and put more beds in here to plant cool weather stuff for over winter here are my sunflower Steve sunflowers they're just starting to get little flower heads beginning to form. I'm so excited for these guys to open up. This is his Van Gogh fantasy mix. And this brilliant man spent nearly two decades developing these. They were just released to the public this year for the first time. And y'all, Steve is currently working on a variegated sunflower. It is so cool looking. Of course, genetics and all that stuff, it's probably going to be a little while before that one is available, but it is extremely cool, and he's got quite a few of them growing. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for, for these flowers. They are unique and beautiful. There's nothing else like them, and I'm just, it's a very cool story. Now beyond the potatoes, you can see the potatoes in here, these were the most recently planted ones, so we probably won't harvest those for another month. Some of those even still have blooms on them. Um, I'm not, I don't think this row's even bloomed yet. Beyond that, we've got sweet potatoes. It's pretty weedy in there. Um, those sweet potatoes will take over a lot of those weeds and grow. I think I have about seven rows of sweet potatoes. And right past the sweet potatoes in the ground, we have winter squash and watermelons. Um, and this, Benjamin and I stumbled upon these a couple of days ago. Look, we have some little baby watermelons. There's another one right there. That's pretty exciting. This is gonna be so beautiful with all of those sunflowers blooming. Just can't wait to see it. I did see that the winter squash down here is a butternut squash variety, and they are really starting to put on some fruit. Hopefully we can keep those healthy until harvest. Winter squash is not grown in the winter, as you can see. Here it is in the summer garden. Although coming out early in the morning when the pollinators are all out. They're having a little party in the blossoms. You can see them there. Look at that. That was a faciated blossom. So this was a blossom that was fused. There's three, three squash growing from where there was obviously one, one blossom. That's funny. We'll let that grow and see what happens. So winter squash does not grow in the winter. Um, it's, it is a squash just like the yellow squash and zucchini that are very much, um, are staples of summer food. A winter squash, which pumpkins are winter squash, um, butternut squash, acorn squash, uh, these are kind of more staples of what we think of as our fall food. Uh, they are all similar plants. There are a few different branches of the squash family, but uh, all very much related and they all need warmer weather to grow and just one frost will kill them. Uh, very, very cold, tender plants. A lot of people get confused by the terminology summer squash and winter squash because they assume that they grow during those times when in fact 
we call them summer squash and winter squash because that's when we typically eat them. So summer squash are plants that we harvest young, uh, thin-skinned squash. These are very immature fruits. So if you leave a zucchini on a plant, which we came out here and harvested a lot of, of um, yellow squash and zucchini last night. I had hoped to do this video yesterday morning and I wasn't able to. And so I had left them on and I knew I couldn't leave them on even until this morning because they grow so fast. And sometimes you'll miss one or you'll think, oh, it's fine and you'll come back out a day or two later. And it's the Size of a baby it's huge uh, if you were to leave your zucchini squash on a plant they would get really really big I'm talking like huge several pounds and then they would stop growing and their skin would begin to get harder and harder and harder um, just like a pumpkin just like a butternut squash and you could theoretically cure the a zucchini squash just like you would a pumpkin the thing is is that a lot of the varieties that we accustomed we are accustomed to eating as summer varieties they don't necessarily store as well they don't taste as good their flesh isn't as palatable so we usually harvest those young and eat them young whereas with this little butternut squash i could harvest this young like this when its skin is really soft and eat it like a summer squash we don't typically do that because they don't have a lot of these varieties that we have typically used as winter squash. They do store better. Their flesh is better after they've been able to grow more and be cured. And a lot of times they don't have as much flavor as a summer variety. So winter squash like these, when they're allowed to stay on the plant until they're full sized, until their skin has allowed to really harden, uh, you take them and then you cure them, which is allowing them to harden even further by putting them out um, in a place to essentially dry. Then you can put them in in storage and they last for months in storage so this is why we t tend to think of winter squash as a fall and winter food you know you're used to eating like your butternut soups and uh, different pastas and things that have butternut or pumpkin in them we think of pumpkin as a really fall flavor it grows in the summer and that is why when you look at winter squash varieties a lot of times they're 100 110 days to maturity whereas summer squash varieties are like 50 to 55 days to maturity if you planted both of them at the same time at 55 days those pumpkins would be little thin skinned things just like the, the summer squash the zucchini if you left both of the fruits on the plants for 110 days they would both be large hard skin things the zucchini would be just like the pumpkin so right now if you have 55 days left of frost free growing time um, maybe a little bit more than that to account for the shorter days in the fall you can grow more summer squash I'll be continuing to plant summer squash varieties over the course of the next few months I'll plant a lot more in like August and do a big squash summer squash harvest in the fall before the frost comes because I don't have pests nearly as bad during that time whereas you're going to run out of time on your your winter squash sooner because they take so long to mature on the vine i've grown pumpkins i've grown some butternut squash but i've never had just like a bumper crop because i've dealt with squash bugs and borers and those pests so bad that it's really hard for me to keep these plants alive long enough for a winter squash to come to the maturity it needs to be to to be able to properly uh, cure and store they're looking good now though and i'm excited to see it all right let's look at the tomatoes here now, my tomatoes look worse than they ever have this year. I think that's for a number of reasons. We did get some contaminated soil. Mostly that's contained to the high tunnel and to um, a couple of the rows out in the garden. Um, we did use some of it in some of these beds, like especially places it was really clayish soil and backfilled it to try to give it something a little easier and so there are a couple plants that are just really really messed up um which is what it is we're gonna we're gonna address that we're gonna fix it but some of the issues i'm seeing out here like this this is just because it's it's hot um this really intense curling it's really hot i've got here where you can see blossoms are just missing the blossoms fall off of tomato plants whenever it's consistently over 
90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's why it's really important if you live in a really hot climate like I do to start your tomato plants early so that they can set fruit before it gets too hot for them to set fruit. Whoa! Y'all check out that. Okay, little learning moment. This is pretty cool. This is called a faciated blossom. So if you can look here, I don't want it to fall off. Um, you can kind of see it on the stem that this is multiple blossoms fused together. Let's see if I can count them. One, two, three, four, five. That may be six. That might actually be six flowers. That's one of the biggest ones I've seen. So it's pretty common in heirloom varieties for multiple blossoms to grow fused together faciation. And I showed you those squash over there that were multiple squash growing together. That was from a faciated blossom. It was a fused blossom. And it's really common in heirloom tomatoes. And that's why you often get heirloom tomato fruit that has like um, kind of weird pockets on the bottom. I'll find a picture and put it up on the screen. That's called cat facing. Uh, that's not a sickness. That's nothing really wrong. That's completely fine. You, it's become very expected in heirloom tomatoes. A lot of times people think that that's just a trait of heirloom tomatoes, but that comes because heirlooms are more like to set faciated blossoms, fused blossoms, which means that they're growing fused fruits. So whenever you have a lot of cat facing, that came because multiple blossoms grew together. Um, hybrids have been bred to not do that as much because hybrids have been bred for commercial production, which means that you want really uniform fruit. So you, that's why you don't see stuff like that so much at the grocery store. Now, I'm sure that they grow and I'm sure that they throw them out because obviously grocery stores are asking for that uniform fruit, so that's what they get. And cat facing is not bad. Um, I will tell you, I don't have an example of it here in my garden because when I see faciated blossoms, I pull them off. Um, you can get really, really big fruit from faciated blossoms. Occasionally, I'll get one that I just gotta know what's gonna happen, like that bad boy. I'm gonna leave it. Hopefully it doesn't fall off uh, with the heat. Hopefully it'll actually set a fruit and we'll get to watch it grow. I am fascinated occasionally, but the truth is is that a lot of times cat-faced tomatoes, you know, one part of the tomato, because it's technically, genetically, different fruits that are growing fused together, um, like conjoined together. Sometimes you'll have like half of the tomato will get ripe while the other is still green. And so then by the time the whole thing's ripe, half of it is rotten, or it'll end up having like rot spots and pockets on the inside because sometimes there are crevices and little caverns in the tomato that little insects can get in and all that stuff. So I typically do pull faciated blossoms off the plant but sometimes I let him grow. I'm gonna let that one grow. Because that is quite a doozy. It's crazy. Very cool. Nature is so cool. Regarding the curling and the heat, you know, it's not great. It's not great. I would rather see my plants healthy, but it's not surprising. Uh, seeing this kind of thing, as long as they're not like hard wilting, as long as there's not just a whole lot of places that are brown and spotting and drying up, um, this should still grow fruit that's fine to eat. And really this should not be surprising to see. Um, I mentioned shade cloth. If you're growing in a hot place and you're dealing with this you're dealing with a lot of curling curling is just a sign of stress um it can come from not having enough water it can come from having too much water now i know that it's been over 100 degrees fahrenheit 38 celsius celsius almost every day for the last two weeks we've had a couple of breaks here and there which is probably why i still have tomato setting fruit is that they're getting cooler nights and it is cooling down some occasionally. Uh, we've been getting thunderstorms somewhat regularly which is also bringing the temperature down and allowing them to still set fruit but it's been hot and so they're stressed out. I'm stressed out. I'm hot right now. I probably start curling up too. Like it's it's not surprising. I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, it would be good to maybe put some shade cloth up over here. I was driving yesterday. I'm a garden rubbernecker. Um, if I see a garden on the side of the road, I'm going to slow down and like look at it real slow. And I was driving through rural South Carolina. There are a lot of gardens. And I saw where a person 
had essentially like had their row of tomatoes like this and they had just erected a long strip of shade cloth just over the top of one row it wasn't like hanging up in some fancy way there was no structure they had just taken the shade cloth and kind of put it, it wasn't a cattle panel they had some other kind of cage they'd made out of fence which held the shade cloth up and it, so it wasn't like shading the entire plant it wasn't in a fancy way it was just draped over the top of these cages that they'd made with fencing and i thought that is so smart that is really cool to just lay it over the top and it's not a big deal and it's offering some reprieve from the sun to these plants on these 100 degree days so i might play around more with shade cloth probably not this season because we have just a ton of stuff going on um, but I think being able to just throw a shade cloth over the top of these plants would probably alleviate a lot of that curling and maybe allow them to set more fruit, um, you know, instead of dropping their blossoms. Now over here, the okra row is coming along. It's looking good. I do not see any flowers yet, but I bet we're getting pretty close. So we'll probably be harvesting okra. I would assume that we'll have okra pods within the next two weeks pretty steadily. And even though the tomatoes are looking a little rough, you can see here that I've got quite a bit of fruit set on here, which is nice. I've been harvesting a handful of cherry tomatoes. There's a couple there that are red. Um, goodness, that pepper is like, talk about me. There we go. And there's a pepper plant, eager to be seen. Um, little puny, but we'll see. Now, um, Benjamin came out here and cleaned me out of cherry tomatoes last night. There's a couple more here that are starting to turn, but I'm gonna leave them for him because he is so excited. Of all the tomatoes though, I'll show you what I'm most thrilled for. Look at these black beauties. They look so good. Let me tell you a little bit about these guys. Um, black beauty is a variety of tomato. It was developed by Brad Gates from uh, Wild Boar Farms out in California. And he, like Steve breeding the sunflowers, breeds new varieties of tomatoes by saving seeds, finding anomalies, and then um, basically growing them and saving for that trait over the course of several generations until it is a reproducible seed. And black beauties were kind of like one of those things when they first came out that people were like, wow, you know, we've never seen anything like this before. And what causes this purpling is something called anthocyanins that grow, and now it's becoming more common there are a lot of tomatoes that have anthocyanins here's an example right next to me these are called black strawberries oh i got one that's pretty ripe Eve, these were released by uh, baker creek this year so anthocyanins are actually really good for us to eat and in a variety if you were growing a fruit that is known for having anthocyanins the thing that brings them out the most is sun so black beauties i actually grew Black Beauties and Blue Beauties, which are known for their deeply purple shoulders, um, and a high tunnel with shade cloth a couple years ago, and they were all just red. There was hardly any um, purple on them at all. But as you can see here, the very sun that is causing the leaves to curl is causing these things to be deeply, deeply purple. All right, as you can tell, I have changed, um, and I'm not just being like a garden tour diva. It's actually a few days later. I got interrupted making this video and um it's been raining a lot it's kind of interesting because i just edited the first half because i wanted to be fresh on what i had covered and i came out to finish shooting this and like i'm wondering if you can tell how much has changed out here just a brief little period so i just got out here and here's the tomatoes we were looking at a few days ago um interestingly there's a little bit of cat facing on that one um Got some cracking because we've gotten a lot of rain. I have a couple of tomato plants that are starting to redden. Unfortunately, they're some of the stunted ones. Rain does so much for a garden. And um, you can water it, but rain has soluble nitrogen in it and it just really boosts the garden. We've got a lot of basil right here. I'm gonna go ahead and pluck some of this. I show this in another video that's coming up later this week about harvesting and pruning basil but you can see it twice repetition is good for us um if you look at this basil here the stem there's a spot on the stem where the leaves branch out 
and there are these new stems that are growing. I call that the armpits. They're growing in the armpits. That's where you want to prune your basil and harvest it if you're coming out to harvest and that's going to allow your plants to bush up. I just shot a video yesterday which you will see later this week with Taylor where she was showing us how to make tea out of basil and guys you're going to want to watch that. It's life changing. So far I haven't got a ton of cherry tomatoes but this Torangina variety which is an F1 hybrid. I don't grow a lot of hybrids, but occasionally I'll, I will. Specifically when they're hybrids that have been grown for flavor. So if I come across one that was developed to have like a certain flavor, a good flavor, I will grow it. And this has been worth it. Um, I'll put the spelling up on the screen because it's kind of a, a strange spelling. Um, these are super, super sweet. I will say they seem to have split a lot, but when you're getting rain, and extreme heat that's pretty normal so if you're growing fruit and this is the case for tomatoes it's very common in tomatoes but you'll see it in other things that do have a higher water content like melons do this also if they're getting watered inconsistently which sometimes that's up to you as a gardener and sometimes you're completely out of control of it because it happens with the rain but um, if they're getting inconsistent watering that's what splitting comes from it's not necessarily too much water it's just too much water um, too quickly specifically when the plant has been dry and so if, it, if you haven't been watering regularly and you get a heavy rain they're gonna split if you're not watering regularly and then you come out and water and put hoses on or a sprinkler on for two hours they're gonna split and it's kind of a hard like dance to navigate because like you don't want to overwater your stuff because that that dilutes the flavor. Um, I think watering on a schedule and trying to water like every few days very deeply, I have found that helps the most in keeping them from splitting. If it's very very hot, um, and therefore your fruit is kind of drying out more, and then you get a really heavy rain, you'll see that splitting. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do about it. I've I'm seeing that in my garden right now. I have really tried to get these Armenian cucumbers to like stay on their trellis and they are not <laughs> they're going all over the place and i just don't really mind i don't mind a wild garden but look at this um these are getting a little bigger but i've got quite a few i'm not going to harvest them right now but i will probably come out here this evening and do that so these are going to go into pickles um i will tell you on the armenian cucumbers they are sold as cucumbers they're usually listed as cucumbers um with a seed company but they are in fact melons and um well i'm gonna pull this one because it's getting real big so um this is not huge for an armenian uh, they can get significantly longer significantly wider kind of like those summer squash um turning you know summer squash and winter squash thing the longer they stay on the vine the more mature they get the larger their seeds get the harder their skin gets and with the armenian um as it gets larger it really takes on more of those melon characteristics and a couple years ago i had some that got really large just kind of got away from me and i harvested them and thought what, what would it be like if we used them as melons so broke it open ate it i'll say it doesn't have a ton of flavor it's not super sweet but what i did with it is i took it i scooped the flesh out blended it with some like yogurt and honey or maple syrup i can't remember which one i used and then froze it in a popsicle mold and made popsicles for my kids and it was really really good um, it does have a mild melon flavor it's just not super sweet so if you can add something to it 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 turns out really well I think the tromboncino squash is just showing off what do you think check this out so with these this is kind of the summer squash winter squash thing you can do a tromboncino anyway either way so if you harvest it small like this really soft skin um, I do like them a little smaller for the tenderness, but they stay pretty good even when they get larger. The thing is, they, they're not super strong flavored. This is a volume food thing. They do grow so much volume. I mean, right now, there's just pounds and pounds of food on this plant that I got to figure out something to do with. But this is one that you can actually allow to get hard 
and then cook it more like a winter squash, like roasting it. Um, and it's pretty good for that also. This is four plants, two on, a, two on either side. Isn't that crazy? It's like taking over, it's going down here. And I tried to stop it, but it was pretty persistent, so I just let it have its way. And so here are some cucamelons, um, which these I haven't really, oh, there's a little flower. Okay, so we'll start getting some fruit on here soon. I hadn't seen the flowers until just now. But um, these will grow all over this. I don't know what'll happen here. Battle Royale in the garden. This is celosia. So this is really just a, an ornamental thing because I like it. I actually don't know. I need to look up and see if celosia is edible. I, I don't know that. That's not why I grew it. I grew it just because it was pretty and it has not disappointed. Here I've got some nasturtium. That is edible, all parts of that. And here I have green noodle beans on one side, red on the other. Um, they're starting to put on and we've, we've harvested a handful of these. And I am really feeling this area of the garden. Can you tell I like it when it gets wild? Um, oh, yes, look. Ground cherries. Oh, these are so good. So I've been saving these for Maya whenever I find them. So I'm going to put most of these in my pocket, but I'll have one now. Um, ground cherries. They're like a cherry version of a tomatillo. They're so good. Um, now there are wild ground cherries that grow. Um, they're kind of considered a noxious weed in a lot of places. And they are different than these. But these ground cherries are edible, obviously. You just want to wait until they turn yellow and fall off the plant. You don't want to eat them green. They say they're toxic. I think you have to eat quite a few to actually hurt yourself. Um, and they taste terrible. So I can't imagine someone would really eat enough bitter, unripe ground cherries to like really get sick. But once they're ripe, they're so sweet and delicious. So I've got this Persian basil growing uh, really large and lovely. And I noticed that I had some pretty serious uh, bug damage here. And I'll tell you who's doing it. Because I can catch them in the act. Japanese beetles. So the best way to deal the best way to deal with bugs like Japanese beetles is to pull them off and put them in like a bucket of soapy water. Um, if you want to get into like using something to actually kill them, you could do things like diatomaceous earth. I actually haven't sprayed anything like that on my garden this year because I don't even like to use organic pest control. I did do a video a couple months ago kind of outlining all of the details of organic pest control. Um, I will put a link to that down below. If you're gonna use it, I think just knowing how to use it properly is very good. I typically hand pick. The thing is, I've really only seen serious damage from the Japanese beetle beetles on some amaranth over here. That basil, they've just turned this amaranth to lace. But, I mean, I'm actually not that upset about that. The one thing that is really interesting in organic gardening is sometimes you just have trap crops or um, sacrifice crops. So you'll grow things and the insects will flock to those things and leave the other stuff alone. So, so far I've seen that damage. I have pulled them off and put them in soapy water when I could, but I'm not trying to broadcast everything because my garden is full of pollinators right now. And if I put diatomaceous earth on because the beetles are putting holes in my basil and then it damages the bees, because it will, and then, I'm, and then I'm having issues elsewhere, I just traded one problem for the other. So really, is it that big of a problem that those, those things are getting damaged or is it okay because it's a trap crop? Obviously that's gonna come down to personal choice. My choice has pretty much been to leave it alone. Y'all, I planted these zinnias here between these two trellises and they're just peeking through and I am just here for it. How pretty is this? Is that just life giving? So all down here, I've got my silver slicer cucumbers, been harvesting very steadily from those. On this side, I have pretty much the only peppers out here. Um, I think we're getting to where we could probably harvest some. Um, these plants are growing, looking good. On this trellis are Kajari melons, which I've been uh, training them up, but they're just really bushy and full. I guess I could uh, prune them some and, and cut some of them back, but I don't know. They seem happy right now, so 
I'm not mad about the fact that they're filling up the walkway. They're setting quite a few fruits. They look really good. And down here I have a couple more kinds of melons. Um, on this side I have the Kiku Chrysanthemum melon, which they uh, grow to be about this big and really just like a one person melon and they're white, a real mild sweet flavor. Over here, this one's new to me. This is called the Tiger Melon, I think. Um, can't remember, I need to look it up. I'm pretty sure that's what that was. But it looks really good, it's very pretty. I really didn't know how well this garden was gonna turn out, but I'd say it's, it's going well. All right, a quick look into this greenhouse. Of course, I still got things in the middle that are waiting to be planted out as we get other spaces ready. And on the right side here, these are the rhubarbs that lived. Uh, we were a little late getting them in the ground and some of them I think just got too damaged from the heat in the pots. I don't know that this is where the rhubarb is gonna stay. It's very frost tender. I put it here to protect it from the sun and from the heat and this is kind of the coolest place I had to offer on this side of the greenhouse. Uh, but we may end up moving that out. We might end up putting it between the two. I might end up putting it in a more shady spot. But as for right now, it's doing okay here and I'm fine with it being here. Uh, these are actually some started seeds for artichokes and these are going to go in the spaces on this side of the bed where there's not rhubarb. Here, the citrus plants are all doing pretty nicely. You can see the kumquats are starting to set more fruit. I'm excited to see that. Kind of having issues with our ground being really soft in here. We might end up putting stone down on the walkways of this since everything that's in here is more permanent. Wow, look at this little lime. That's so cool. All right, I had to stop and put the sprinkler on that back bed where I planted ginger because it's just barely starting to come up and it was really dry. So into the other high tunnel where my camera won't get wet. So this is the tunnel where we were experiencing, are experiencing some damage from herbicide traces that were in some purchased compost we had and that we are currently um, beginning some experiments to work on. Now the herbicide that was in here is pretty telltale because it doesn't affect some things like zinnias and cucumbers. As you can see, these are great. This Cuban oregano, super healthy. Holy basil, very healthy. I will say some of the peppers with the applications of compost tea, they're starting to recover. Some are still very stunted. And here um, we have planted a couple of different things. And what we're gonna do, we are going to go ahead and take these tomatoes out. I don't think they're gonna be making any recovery and really giving any sort of um, harvest because of the stunting. But we planted some corn, uh, some wheat, and I'm gonna do a couple of other things like sunflowers we might repeat with some different varieties. I've read quite a few studies at this point about hemp cleaning soil um, because the laws here in South Carolina, I cannot legally do that. Um, even the low THC varieties of hemp, you have to get a permit during a certain window of time in order to grow them. And uh, being a public figure, I'm gonna follow the rules on that one. Uh, but in the future, I would love to be able to test that and see how that does because there are some very promising studies showing that that helps. My plan here is to take the tomatoes out, uh, continue to plant with things that are known to clean soil. I think I'm gonna leave the peppers and see uh, the peppers and the eggplants both have really like these eggplants are really showing some signs of improvement I mean, they're definitely still stunted and not normal uh, The ground cherries we're gonna go ahead and take out because they're pretty messed up their fruit is coming in kind of deformed uh, But the peppers and the, the eggplants I think we'll see if we can maybe still get a harvest by feeding this soil with worm teas and compost teas. We did uh, start an experiment with mushrooms. I did film that. That'll be up later this week. Um, I just have to edit it and put it up. But Will and I had gone out to Mushroom Mountain and got some uh, spawn for some King Strafori and some oyster mushrooms that we're going to work uh, into our plan here. And I think that by planting plants that are good for remediation, as well as supporting the healthy microbiome of the soil with things like worm teas 
and adding in things like mushrooms whose mycelium has been shown to help with remediation. I, f I am hopeful that we could m even plant nightshades in this high tunnel next year successfully. I, I feel like I've seen a little bit of improvement on some things. The tomatoes I don't see any improvement on with the compost teas, but we haven't done anything else yet. Um, I'm going to let these finish growing and again, plant these things that we know are going to pull toxins out. It is going to be a process to uh, work on this soil in that way, but if at the end of the process um, we know more about how to guide people and advise people into uh, redeeming contaminated soil then it's a process worth going through and I'm excited to kind of report to you guys as we move forward on these experiments what it looks like so that is the overview of the garden over the course of this week uh, this did span out over a few days isn't it amazing how much it changes every day right now is such a hard season when you're in the midst of garden season it's hot it's physically demanding you know you start to deal with the burden of abundance of having so much of something and having to give the time and energy to preserve it or else it just goes to waste it can get a little overwhelming but the thing that I keep remembering and reminding myself is staying in the moment and just being so overjoyed to be in the season. I love to take lots of photos to do videos and I encourage you to do this. In the thick of the struggle of garden season, I absolutely encourage you to document it. And when this winter rolls around and you miss your garden and you're stuck in the house, you can look at all those pictures. And then the next year, whenever the hard comes back, you're like, oh no, I'm gonna miss this. And that's what I'm really holding on to right now. I'm so enjoying having a garden again and getting to share it with you. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you until next time.